Okay, all together. This is April 22nd, 2018, Earth Day. So, we wish you a happy Earth Day. We wish you a happy Earth Day. We wish you a happy Earth Day and a livable future. Okay, thank you all. Okay, this is the third week of our class and uh, we're going to run over uh, past assignments a little bit. I want to fill in the first week's assignment that we talked a little bit about last week that I, I didn't get everybody's feedback on. Uh, I've outlined that on the, the uh, uh, backboard here on carbon. Phil said using the handouts and all of his bills, he came up with a 20 ton carbon footprint. But when he went to Nature Conservancy and used their uh, ballparky kind of thing, it was a 60 ton. Uh, Linda has reduced hers way down from over 10 tons. It was like 14 several years ago to one and two third tons by the computer build it up, including your electricity, natural gas, gasoline, transport fuels, uh, water and uh, sewer treatment. And uh, in hers, according to Nature Conservancy, was 24 tons. Uh, so what did anybody else get for theirs so I can fill in this chart a little bit? Okay, well next week everybody is going to have to bring in their numbers, okay? So, um, some are calculating, they got the raw, but they didn't convert it to tons. Then I'm going to go over um, um, the other thing from week one was how thick was your attic insulation and what kind was it? Uh, so can anybody give me numbers on that? Eight inches? Uh-huh, and, and it's uh, fiberglass and vermiculite. Fiber and vermiculite. Yeah. Okay, any other? Eight inches of fiberglass. Eight inches of fiberglass. Is that a bat or a fill? Bat. Bat. Bat will be a little bit more dense than blown fill. Uh, 36 to 40 of cellulose. I'm losing that behind the screen a little bit. Okay. Um, and then? Uh, eight inches of fiberglass of blown fill. Okay. Anybody else? I guess that's. Linda's got sales on top of fiberglass up to a rated R90. Uh, so. Okay. Uh, good. Um, and then for this week, the assignment was to look at your windows, look at your doors and your walls. How many of you have frame walls? Okay. All but two. What do you have? Oh, you got a okay. combination of brick walls and frame walls. <clears throat> brick outside and frame. Okay. What are your walls like? And you didn't have this brick. brick. And the inside plaster, so it's a brick, solid brick with a plaster? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. So mainly frame. Okay. Then uh, for windows, how many of you have metal framed windows? That's the older. Okay. You do. How many of you have vinyl replacements for the metal? Okay. Four. How many of you have wood windows? One. Is that an original old wood window or a more... Replacement. It's a replacement. Does it have a, a, an aluminum or steel clad on the outside? Or is it just a wood outside, wood inside? It's a wood. Sure. Okay. Yeah, some of the newer ones as replacements. Uh, Pella has some that have wood, but there's a metal to keep the weather off on the outside. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, how many of you have those windows as double glazed? Thermal pane. Okay, um, and you have single? single? Single pane. Do you have storm windows on your single pane? No. So you're really an R1 for all your window space. Thermal pane gets to R2 if it doesn't have any low E coatings. If you get. You put plastic. You, double pane. You, you put a piece of plastic over in the winter. We, yeah. Okay, and that does help. It cuts the loss in half. Uh, okay. Um, 
How many of you have quad pain? John. Because he has the Pella that are really, really, not Pella, excuse me, the Alpen that are really, really good. Um, and they have uh, uh, Superman uh, uh, prevention uh, gases inside. They have Krypton. <laughs> so if it keeps the good guys away, it probably keeps the bad guys away too. Oh. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, good. And then uh, that's windows. Um, when you looked at your doors, do any of you have vestibules or airlocks for entry? John does on the front. Good. Okay. The garage count? The garage accounts for one of the maybe three or four or five doors. <laughs> right. That's a, count as a vestibule to the to, to kitchen. the kitchen. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's, but but you probably have a front door and a back door and maybe a side door and that's why I say three, four, or five doors. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, did any of you look at whether you could enclose an outer covered porch to easily be a vestibule, which would give you that? I'll let you think about that. Linda has <laughs> looked at that possibility. And we'll next week actually see pictures of what that possibility for hers would be. Okay, um, thank you for the review of, of possibilities. Okay. This is session three. Um, I am Steve, and this is Jefferson Unitarian Church, Golden, Colorado. And this is a production of the Green Task Force with amazing help from Jamie uh, on video. Thank you, Jamie. I want everybody to express appreciation to Jamie. He is a very professional. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. Okay. What we're going to talk about today are the bigger energy gobblers that you have. So your uh, heating and uh, cooling um, and then uh, uh, other uh, things that gobble energy and what options are to the gobbling of energy. So we'll talk about a water heater, then we'll go to gas furnaces, boilers, or propane or electric furnaces, and then air conditioning or evaporative cooling and options to that. Uh, heat pumps for many different purposes, either air or ground sourced heat pump for extracting heat efficiently from the environment to bring it in or get it out. And then major appliances, refrigerators, clothes dryers, and alternatives for food preservation in the case of the refrigerator and for mechanical hose dryer. Then we'll talk about luxuries, ways that our nation sets us apart, uh, self apart over many others for using energy, fossil fuels, where it's just for sport and fun with total disregard to the rest of the world. Okay, so uh, that's what I call the pointless energy gobblers. Um, so outdoor spas, heated swimming pools, and other keep up with the Joneses category of things, as well as ATVs, jet skis, snowmobiles, and that's why we are the per capita carbon king. Okay, we, um, it's not one of those um, royal families that you necessarily want to uh, be the head of. Um, okay, and so it brings up the question of what is moral and what is fair. And the U.S. is way out there compared to these other countries. Third world countries are down here. And if we're all going to get a livable planet for grandkids, everything's going to have to be down. Okay, we need to cut 80% by 2050, and that means we need to be there, and the whole world does, so all of these have to be, or we can even it out and be truly fair. So what is moral and what is fair? Um, now, in looking at things, when you make a purchase, you need to think, how long is this thing going to last? What's its useful life? Because if you buy something that's very wasteful and has a long useful life and therefore a long depreciation curve or amortization schedule, then you're locking in wastefulness for a long time. Uh, so electric lighting bulbs get replaced pretty often. Uh, the new ones that are very efficient last longer. They have some early failure, uh, infant failure, but now hot water heaters, 
it's about three replacements in the next 35 years typically. They, they like to say they're a 20 year life. They don't get uh, warranted for more than 10. They like to say it's more than you're willing to stand behind if you're a manufacturer. That's the way things work. Space heaters are longer. Um, light duty vehicle cars, light trucks, are you know, not to the first owner necessarily, but a 20 year kind of life. Um, uh, industrial boilers get maybe a uh, 25 year. An electric power plant, like when Excel was putting in the power plant down in Pueblo, uh, Cherokee 3 and 4, I think it was, in 2007, 8, 9, um, it has an amortization that goes out to 2068. And it was coal based, which says they're locking in with Excel customers paying them a return on their investment out till then. Um, so a lot of people were fighting that at the time because it made no sense to plan to be burning coal till 2068. Um, uh, and then a residential building, this is saying it, you won't replace it in the next 35 years, typically. Um, so uh, just... Question. Yeah. What is the purpose of the new electric bulbs? The new electric bulbs are to save a lot of energy and last a long time. Okay. I'm, I'm going to try to keep people focused on the trend I'm going rather than getting... Okay. I have more than enough for an hour. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Now, prices. I like to talk about energy and I like to talk about carbon consequences of energy. And therefore, price usually doesn't come into it. But when we get into the water heaters, you'll see that the yellow label, when you get one, always has price and for the year's use. And, but prices on natural gas is all over from $2 per um, uh, uh, million BTUs up to $15, $16. So, you know, how do you trend price? With fracking, it came down. It was going up because all of the traditional wells were uh, running out. They were declining badly, so we have fracking. And now we're fracking underneath schools and everything. <laughs> the wellhead can't be under the school. It uh, can't be on the school grounds, but the limits are about a half a mile. But they just go fracking right underneath. Uh, but that, the fracking, we're getting kind of to the, all the good stuff's already gone. So natural gas prices are going to go up, especially since we've been building export facilities for natural gas to sell to those markets that don't have it, like Japan, and to feed some of the European markets that are totally dependent on Russia. And that Russian natural gas valve can be turned off, and it was turned off. Uh, for a couple of countries a couple of years ago. And so when supply demand, if we start shipping our supply out, we'll have less here. And the abundance, the temporary abundance, is going to be gone. So price is a funny thing. Supply demand, that depends on how many markets and depends on what the base availability was. And the richest stuff is already gone. Okay, now we're going to talk about water heaters. Many different options. This is most of them. And we're going to look at this with a lot of things. I'm going to jump first on the natural gas. A base one is 60% efficient. You can get an electric, electric ignition. We'll see a picture of Linda's with electric ignition that makes it better. But you have a little flue pipe going out the top of a natural gas um, hot water heater. You can get some that even play more games than that and get up to 80%. Um, but they don't get above 80% for natural gas hot water heater. And if you take the total monthly charge spread over a nominal 20 year life, you get about 19 to 19.8 um, dollars a month for a typical family of four da 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 habits for hot water heating. Now, if you take an electric, this will cost 500, same as the inefficient natural gas, you're at about 29. This is for a straight caloric rod, cow rod uh, water heating. It happens to be 100% efficient 
because the waste when you're doing anything like this goes off in heat. <laughs> so it's doing heat. The waste is in heat. So the waste is part of the product, kind of a. But 100 is not great in this case, as we'll see. Uh, $29, so more than either of the natural gas options. Okay, solar thermal water on the roof, the water panels, with backup. You always, if you go on solar thermal, you get a cloudy few days and you have no hot water. So you bring it in, you exchange the solution there into water, that water goes into a backup water heater. That backup water heater, if you have the most efficient, which is a heat pump water heater, then you get um, $28.6 a month. And uh, uh, then I'm going to go and a tankless or instant, this is a electric tankless or instant, it'll be, and it's an interesting bunch of numbers because it depends on how the rates are done in your state and whether you're an industry or an individual. Some states, there's something that's called a demand charge. You get charged, they, they sense what was the highest used at any one moment, and they compute a charge over the whole month for that, and then they also use your usage. And so industries always pay a demand charge because that's what gives a peak and makes them have to generate and have more generation capacity. And so, so you can get that it's 35 to $147 a month, depending on how demand charges can come into play. Um, and then I'm gonna come, the best one, and where things are now going, they really came out late 2009, uh, didn't get much distribution until 2011, but they appeared in Colorado in 2010. And it's a heat pump water heater without a thermal on the roof. But if you have photovoltaics on the roof, you're running it with the sun's energy. And uh, uh, so life, all these are 20 year nominal um, uh, cost per month to run it. By the way, you compare that to the electric, um, uh, well, energy per month, 10.5 uh, versus 27. Um, so uh, it's almost three times as efficient for how much energy it uses a, uh, that it uses compared to just a cal rod. Because it's acting like an air conditioner that pulls cool in from outside or refrigerator that pulls heat out from inside with a compression and release cycle. And um, so a heat pump, heat pumps are extremely efficient. So this gets the cheapest bottom line at fourteen and a half dollars a month. Um, so this is a GE heat pump water heater. This is the one I installed in 2010. I got it. It was the first one sold actually in Colorado because I was hunting, um, and it said that it would use one hundred ninety-eight dollars um, for the year or eighteen hundred fifty-six kilowatt hours. Now I say heat pump; they're hybrid, meaning that if you have high demand, it has cow rods in there that will kick on because you've got your grandma and 15 cousins and they're all taking back-to-back -back showers. So I run it in a non-hybrid mode, in the pure heat pump mode, so I do much better than that and I don't have the high demand. I can switch it at any time, push on the buttons and switch it and it will be a hybrid and based on need, it will change what it is uh, operating as. Um, now, in Lowe's, uh, a couple of weeks ago, they have a newer one. So there's eight year newer design or nine year newer design. And this is by A.O. Smith, that's what they have there. Um, 10 year warranty, 50 gallon or 80 gallon, this is a 50 gallon. The heat pump is on top, the 50 gallon tank is below. That's the same, the heat pump was on top, and this is below. Now on heat pumps, you say, well, where's it getting it from? It's getting it from the air in your utility room. Where's the air in the utility room getting it from? It's getting it out of the basement floor. And so it's an air-linked ground source 
because Mother Earth is maintaining 55 degrees there most of the time. And so that is putting some heat in. So it's putting out much colder air that's dropping down and warmer air is coming up and the vents are here. Okay, a clarification question in the back? Uh, just a point of interest for people who are considering this technology. Uh, Excel offers a pretty sizable rebate, like on the order of 450 bucks for okay. these. Yeah. But they only do it on the 50 gallon, but not the 80 gallon. Okay, okay, and thank you, but I, I'm, I'm gonna save that to, for in discussion. Okay. So again, there's the heat pump and there's the tank. By the way, I used to go down to Excel's demand side management meetings and I lobbied for that for a long time after I had gotten one, not for me, but for everybody else. And they kept saying, no, no, no. And so they finally said yes. Uh, so now propane, whoa, $638. Now, if you're up in the mountains, you're probably running with propane. Or electric, $555 for a month for the nominal family of four. Okay, a small tank, um, 38, natural gas, 212. So natural gas, it's not high on, I mean, cheap. It's cheap because natural gas is cheap. Now, and here is a, not a base, but an improved, upgraded to electronic ignition. So you don't have the uh, pilot light going all the time, throwing off wasted heat and burning methane inappropriately. And that's Linda's. And the little label on there says 244. Now, you can get a gas tankless, a gas tankless as opposed to an electric tankless, and it's over 2,000 bucks, and it's 175. The thing about that is, when a tankless goes, all the water you have turned on has to be heated instantly as it's going through. And so if it's electric, that's an amazing electric drain all at once. And if it's gas, it's a big gas pipe. Okay. Okay, so the heat pump we saw there. Now, we're moving to space heating. So you got a sense of water heating, lots of options. Um, you can put a bowl out side to catch the sun. You can have, like in Korea, uh, a lot of places up on the roof, there's a big tank of water and it warms with the sun, variably from day to day. And it's a gravity feed. This is more in the rural bits of Korea. Okay, space heating. Ancient, there was a sun and fire in the teepee. And the teepee was vented out the top. There was always a nice little opening uh, or chimney. Then, and, and farms, well, the, the Greeks, the Romans, and Navajo had solar access laws. You were not allowed to shade your neighbor's solar access. That was very prudent before people decided they didn't need to work with nature. Farms had woodlots for the wood stoves. City folks got gas furnaces and the coal, or coal furnaces and the coal trucks came and there was a coal chute and went down to the coal hopper in the basement right by the coal furnace. I remember seeing those when I was young. Many of you probably have seen those. Um, now, chimney sweeps had lifetime employment. Their lives weren't so long because they got a lot of coal dust in their throats. And then we had fuel oil, which is basically diesel oil, and natural gas, and pipes everywhere. And we were fully carbonized, um, as were our skies. Now, broad categories. We can talk about what it's fueled by and how it gets to you. So electric gas, fuel, and natural gas, coal, sunshine. Sunshine caught in water on your roof that then transfers to baseboard or uh, in air, uh, in glass cavities that gets uh, moved to you, uh, or in thermal mass coming through and radiating on a floor. And then it, it can get to you by forced air from your furnace, 
by radiant from a radiant floor, which is very comfortable when you're walking around barefoot inside. Um, you can get baseboard, radiators down low along the side. You can get, for passive solar, a chimney flow where it's passive, where the sun's hitting someplace and it naturally flows up through a house. And you can get either, for solar, a direct solar through your actual living space windows, or indirect, where you have a outer collection chamber or enclosed porch that catches, but then you have to pump that air around through the house. So we're going to see examples of all of those. Now, not only Indians in the teepees, but Ron Larson up on the top of Lookout Mountain has two wood burners, and uh, these wood burners are his only added backup heat because he's got solar hot water tubes and a 10,000 gallon tank. So he's all summer, he's putting water in the tank that's hot. It's insulated, he doesn't remember the amount of insulation. And in the winter on the great sunny days, he's putting warmth into the tank. He's actually got a 10,000 and a 1,000 gallon tank. If you ever go to his house, you walk across the front entryway and you're on top of the 10,000 gallon tank. So, um, but you'll notice he's got a lot of little bits of wood and starter paper and everything on these ones upstairs, ones downstairs. And he doesn't have a gas furnace, he doesn't have coal. And, um, but that house was the house that won the first solar home decathlon by uh, the University of Colorado in Washington, D.C. on the mall. Okay, now for natural gas furnaces, there's condensing, I'll say what that means then, versus non-condensing. Condensing is a total closed system. It brings in combustion air from outside instead of just using vents to take it out of the basement or the utility room. And it's sealed, it burns, and you get on this one 95.5% efficiency in your natural gas. And the fumes go back outside through plastic pipes because it's that efficient that the exhaust is not that hot. And then you see right down here, not much of it's showing. When you have a closed system, you do get some condensate. Hence it's a condensate. And that condensate goes in a little drain line to the drain that hopefully you have right in the utility room next to the furnace. So, oh, I'm sorry, boom. Here is the more convenient, this is 95. The current standards are that a uh, non-condensing, they used to be 60 to 65% back in the 70s when my house was built, and I upgraded to this. Um, Some time in the 90s, they raised the standard, they had to be 78%. Uh, Linda's is here, and that's 90 or 80%. And you notice there are two big six inch ducts, one of them squeezed down that you see here, that are bringing an outside combustion air. The outside combustion air comes in, spills on the floor, and the combustion chamber is in here, and it's getting air from the basement. And that is going out a metal flue pipe up to the roof. Because it's less efficient, the exhaust air is hotter. So you're not running out the side in a PVC plastic pipe. Here's the range 78 to 96.6 for uh, gas furnaces now, and the one 95.5 is right near the top. Okay, now you can get good efficiency on gas another way. Uh, natural gas boiler and baseboard heat. The natural gas boiler can actually go into little plastic pipes under your floor to get a radiant heat. Uh, so you can have it be baseboard, typically long under windows so the warmth is rising where the window cold would have come down. Um, and this is a boiler in my neighbor's house 
and you see it there. And then the distribution, here is where the six lines go off to feed. And actually, it's three going out that are hot and three coming back that are cold for hot water baseboard heat. Now, just like we talked about a um, heat pump water heater being efficient, if you can get your house's base heating demand very low, you can get an amazing thing, which is an air-to-air -air mini split heat pump. And these will, in smaller sizes, get up to, if you know sear values for an air conditioner, a real good sear value for central air is about 15. These will get up to 30, 31. But they can be reversed the other way and they can be heating for you. So this was just installed on my east wall. I have it on the east wall above a enclosed walkway. It's there because when you want the heat most is in the morning. The east wall catches the morning sun and therefore it'll rise quicker. And when you want the cooling, it's in the evening and the hottest time is on the west wall, so the east wall is the coolest for your outside air. You don't really want to put it up on the roof where it's in the sun. And, uh, and to tell you the honest truth, evaporative coolers on the roof is far worse than on the east wall. I mean, they like to be on roofs. I don't know, they crawl up there. They're inanimate objects and they have willpower, I guess, to actually get themselves up on the roof. It's like a kid wants to climb the apple tree. Okay, here's the inside unit. I have this in the dining room. Now, this is called a ductless heating and cooling system. When it's in, here's 29.3 for the sear value. And the heating efficiency rating overall, HSPF, is 13.8. This will productively pull heat out of outside air when it is minus 14 Fahrenheit outside. <laughs> minus 14, and it will pull heat out of that and bring it in. That's kind of amazing. <laughs> now, the same technology can be used for ground source rather than air source. And a ground source heat pump, which often gets misnamed geothermal. Geothermal's base is really where you're doing hot springs and you're pulling steam and you're doing stuff with that. But a uh, ground source heat pump, it has amazingly good uh, numbers. Uh, but you drill the 300 foot hole or two of them, the cost for the ground work is 15 to 20,000. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's got those negatives. Um, so anyway, uh, this is the inside unit, there's its stuff. Now, when Linda and I were in France in October, we stayed at this lovely country inn slash motel, but it didn't look motel-y. And it had units of four together and four together, and the goats were over there and the mushrooms were growing there. And it was, and they, they cooked amazing stuff. I couldn't read the menu right, so I had something I never would have bought, but it was educational. But they did it very well. And anyway, uh, at the one end of four units, you had two of the outside units, and then at the other end you had two. Now, this is for the end one because it has a front and back and a side. That's for the one in the middle because it's only got a front and back. At the other end of the building, they had two units, and those are the outside units. Many split, splits have been made better and better, especially Japan is working their tail off on it because they had something called Fukushima. And Fukushima said that all of the nukes were turned off. So all of the businessmen in downtown Tokyo took off their jackets, their ties. They couldn't be cooling. There was a lot of work that went on in Japan on engineering for many splits. They're all over Europe because all over Germany, they know that they're dependent on Russia 
for fossil fuels. So they're putting PV up, they're putting wind up all over Denmark, and they're cutting their use. They're thickening their walls, like we've talked about the last couple of weeks, and they're developing and installing mini splits. So, um, big ones, small. They're doing the size to fit what they need, but they they understand that they got to get their usage down because the smaller the unit, the more potential for being a high efficiency unit. So, in if you do a PERT chart on what do you do first, you improve, improve, improve your footprint for energy use, and then you size one to where you get. Because you'll get a better one, and you won't be oversizing, and you won't be under-efficienting it. Okay, other solar thermal water. This is what uh, Ron has uh, on his house on Lookout Mountain, where he's got his 10,000 gallon tank. Um, uh, straight electric radiant um, uh, heating, cal rod. This is typically, if you have a little space heater in the cold room, that's what it is. It's a plug-in space heater. Um, uh, and it's 100% efficient because the waste energy is not waste energy because it's doing heat because that's what waste energy does. But if it's using fuel that's coming from Excel, it may be 20% efficient as relative to the mine or the source. So at the spot where it's delivering its function, it's 100%, but it's only 20% end to end. Um, and then rubbing hands together. You can get warm by rubbing hands together. Or put on a sweater. Huh? Put on a sweater. Put on a sweater. <laughs> Layer up. Yeah. Okay. So this is a solar hot water system on a house that also has PV. It also has passive solar. Kind of an interesting house. Um, now, um, but it's got to have a big tank for that. It's interesting, it also has a fireplace because there's the chimney. But an interesting house. And these spaces are also interesting. Here's direct passive. Now, it's in the spring far enough that the overhang here is shading these. The overhang is partly shading those, not shading those. Um, uh, and here's another one. Shades are down here, but overhangs partly shading those. You have to worry if you're direct solar passive, you have to worry about getting it in the summer and what do you do with it. So here it's you're getting some shade on part of that, not on that. So a lot of these people are experiencing warm summers, warmer than they might have wanted. Uh, here's John's house. Now John's addressed this from a lot of points. Um, he actually has shades that can come down automatically outside to cover. He's got direct passive on his walls there, but then he also has indirect these, and we'll see pictures, and these guys down here, because these actually have little fans. So they're little outside rooms, four or five inches thick, that are catching sun, and then a fan blows the stuff in. So it's circulating air through. Here is the indirect. So this is, he gets afternoon sun, and that it's called solar sheet. And it's two words, solar sheet, right, John? It's actually one. One, okay. Put them together. Because it's a and decap. Patent. It's a patent name. Huh? It's a patent name. Patent name, okay, it's trademarked, okay. But um, they're made up in northern Minnesota, Canada. Toronto. Toronto, okay. People up north have learned to make their own too using beer cans or Coke cans and a piece of glass and a box. And there's online, you can find instructions to do 15 designs. They worked. Okay, now I have indirect, so my collection space, this in the summer it's got enough overhang, this has a little overhang up there, but it doesn't, uh, didn't really want to go to the, and, uh, and I'm catching the heat here, but I'm pumping it to the north end of the house through three 12-inch ducts. 
and I have one six inch duct that goes down into the utility room right where the um, heat pump water heater is to add a little bit there. So it requires power distribution. So in the summer when I would be getting hot, these are added spaces. I open that window, that window, that window, another window in the top, and these two here, and this is a 12 inch wide solar, it just chimneys out. I don't have to blow the heat out. I get it to flow out. The, the lower part is the greenhouse, is my main heating part above that point. So by opening those two into that 12 inch wide space, it flows chimney right up and out the four upper windows. So I don't have to blow to cool in the summer. I do have to blow to heat in the winter. This one over here, um, the overhang does pretty darn well. And inside of there is a layered thing too, and we'll see that in a second. That's what it looks like actually at night. It's kind of fun because it's all greenhouse triple wall polycarb. That's the west wall is insulated to R40 because you don't want the cold west winds. And the front, it's got an airlock coming into that. So it's blocked. Uh, and then in the winter, uh, at Christmas time, you get these lights and they change red, green, red, green. And it saves putting up lights on the eaves and taking down lights on the eaves. And, and the string that Costco had also lets you have a red, white, blue, red, white, blue. So you can do, you know, Patriot's Day and the 4th of July and President's Day and all of those things with one string that's permanently up and out of the way. Now, I talked about having a 12 inch wide space and then my, those that you were there when I gave the uh, lecture back in November uh, saw that I have the walk-in clothes dryer. We'll see that again. But this is an inner wall, outer wall. Here you see ductwork. So it's bringing cold air in, it's getting heated up, and then that's getting pumped to the house. This is actually on Alpin's website. These are lovely 925 series, four layer uh, Krypton gas windows. These are something that's a little bit more catching of the sun. Okay, advantages and disadvantages, I've alluded to this. On a direct, which is the classic passive solar into your room. No need to wait for the space that you're wanting to live in to get well, the space outside to get to critical heat before you pump it in because it's coming straight in. So John's house warms much faster than mine in the morning because I'm building up a head of steam outside and then it hits the threshold. The thermostat out there says, yep, we're hot enough and it goes in. John is right through the windows and he's got it. Um, but he gets more winter heat. So he has, with computer control, got it so he runs shades down outside. Beautifully engineered. Most people have not done, nobody's done what he's done like that. Um, now, in the, um, uh, you still get more heat in the summer on the direct when you don't want it because um, there's no way to vent it away, but you can block it with his shades. And um, you have a higher cooling load for the living space, so you have to do evaporative cooling or you have to do something to get it out. So there are two sides of direct versus indirect. Mm -hmm. Now, food preservation. We're getting to refrigeration, that's a big appliance. But you can dry food, you can salt it, you can pickle it, you can smoke it, you can cure it. You can put it in cold storage, a root cellar or a cave on the north side of a hill. You can have an ice box, literally the ice man cometh and with tongs and when I was a kid, he came and he brought the blocks of ice, put it in the top, there's a drain pan in the bottom. If we didn't drain it off enough, there's a puddle on the kitchen floor. Um, and then a refrigerator, wow. Okay, 
You can also dry, you can dry them in a passive solar dryer. So there's a passive solar dryer in the top part of my three floor addition that's the heating space. And uh, yeah. then, then I go, well, yeah. And oh, there's uh, uh, grapes become <clears throat> on the shelves here. Grapes become raisins and other things get dried. So refrigerators. The label for refrigerators is a little different than typical because there's lots of sizes and there's different options and features. So um, this is says it's a $78 a year on a 73.9 for models with similar features. And it's a 78 for all models on a 64 to 99 scale. And these are all at the 25 cubic foot range. Okay, clothes dryers. We're, we're getting into the fun thing. Um, okay, you go back and when I first moved to Korea and when I lived in Nigeria in 1960, moved to Korea in 1982, they washed in the streams and a hot rock on the side, you laid your clothes out and you made sure the rock was kind of clean and that worked fine. Or a bush, you put them across or you put it in your house over the furniture, but nothing that will get hurt by moisture. Um, or you can spread it inside the car on a hot sunny day. Lots of ways to dry clothes. Uh, a gas clothes dryer. These have to be vented by cold because you're putting combustion results, you know, carbon monoxide, etc., and carbon dioxide, into the room if you don't get it vented outside. Then uh, an electric one, it generally is vented because of all the lint and everything, and people have a habit of venting things outside. In both of those cases, you're putting a lot of heat outside. And so that's not an efficient thing on a carbon, a fossil-based fuel to be put outside. And then a walk-in indoor passive solar clothes dryer, which also gives passive heating possibilities. So that is mine and if you and I've improved the lines now but that's where all the clothes drying is that's on the south side that's the first layer of south comes in through the one glass whoops through the outer glass and then the inner glass there's a door that covers this access and uh, so and these are all quote enclosed porches so now um, that's the close. Now, if you take a walk near the uh, convention center, you see this restaurant right in the block, right on 14th, and they have this going. At 7 in the morning, it's going. There's no patrons out here. <laughs> it's going all the time. It's burning methane. Uh, and it's because we are trying to stimulate climate change. That's what they're really trying to do. That's their obvious purpose. I, I can see no other purpose than trying to cause climate change. Um, and I, I wondered about people that are so vested in that motivation. Um, but anyway, there's other luxurious play causing climate change and affecting the disadvantaged disproportionately. And that is gasoline, ATVs, electric. I wouldn't, if it's PV powered, you're okay. Gas snowmobiles gas jet skis, gas dirt bikes, these are all our play, our play that is hurting nature. Gas dune buggies, gas and diesel RVs. We like to play and we like to play with toys and there's a lot of people who want to play with toys that are powered because they're lazy. They won't get a mountain bike and pedal it. They may not be lazy, but maybe they can't carry their whole 24 pack of beer on the mountain bank. I mean, <laughs> that's got to be a good reason. So now, what is moral and what is fair? We understand pretty much why we have the United States over on that side has the most energy use per capita, and that's fossil fuel energy use. So, not only in America can we waste and threaten nature with such wanton abandon, just for thrills, but we pioneered it and through Hollywood 
we spread the waste culture to the world. We're, we're real good at getting that advertised. It was not the Native Americans who started the waste culture. Okay, I'm ready for discussion on anything you like. Yes? Do you have an opinion on heat pump uh, clothes dryers? Um, I haven't seen a heat pump. If you know about one, that would be interesting. I mean, I've been researching it. There only seems to be a few models. And, okay. Uh, they, there are lots of consumer complaints about the performance. The early heat pump items, before they get all the bugs out, typically, you want to buy the extended warranty where generally the extended warranty pays. Not so much the breakdown right issues, it's more the don't really dry clothes all the way, and there's always problems with clogging, clogging the condensers with the lint that comes out of the clothes, you know, sort of a high maintenance. Yeah, it's a, I, I, I totally hear. I, I use the clothesline. It's right inside the glass on the south window. Works good. Yeah, we all, we all don't have a greenhouse on the side of our house as you do. Well, I didn't when I started. I understand. <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember reading about different kinds of uh, refrigerators. When you open up the front door, all the cool air falls out and the heat air gets in. I've seen some that are uh, kind of like a bucket shape where it was in the countertop. So you, it's a, a lid that you pull over the top and you reach down and bring out whatever cold food you've got. and lower the lid on top of it. Yeah. As efficiency, are those available easily? I haven't seen those. I, I think most people of different heights want different height tops if they're gonna do that because mm -hmm. the four foot eight lady is not gonna be able to bend over and get to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And uh, the six foot eight guy is not wanting to bend over that far to something that's set that low. So it's like kitchen countertops. Short people like them low and tall people like them higher, or bathroom countertops. It's, uh, um, so, yeah, there's taste. Consumers do what consumers do. Yeah, any other? Yes? And I'm just wondering what kind of carbon output do you have when you're heating your house with the wood stoves? It's going up the stack, and what you're doing, the thing about a wood stove is this. The wood is in the natural carbon cycle. Okay. So it's been in the air, it's gotten in the leaves, it's become part of the tree, and then when the tree is cut, it then gets in and goes back into, into the, air. the air. And there's a good potential where not as much goes back because if you don't burn down to total ash, you end up with charcoal. And if you take, and we'll talk about this a little bit next week, if you take the charcoal and you crush it fine enough and you put it in your garden, it stays for a millennium. And not only does it stay for a millennium, but it provides nice little micro houses for the good soil uh, microbiotics. Uh, cut little holes in windows and all the cell walls because the carbon is the wall of the old cells. Mm -hmm. And every morning if they're day workers or every night if they're night workers, they go marching out with their bamboo pole and their little red kerchief lunch, uh, just whistling, and they do their work in the soil. Okay. I've heard that biochar is uses a lot of energy just to make it, but once it's in the ground, when using for gardening, it's, it's uh, good for... You, you'll hear lots, lots of stories. The fact is, you can have it be wasteful or you can have it be super productive. Biochar in the pyrolysis, which is an incomplete burning, does put out VOCs. And if you capture those VOCs, they will not only keep that burning going, but they can be used to run 16-cylinder uh, engines at the same time. So it's using some of its byproduct and still it is doing other stuff. Depends on what you do. I've seen that working like that. Could you say that, uh, let's say the usual uh, charcoal sold at, at uh, grocery stores and... and I, I'm not stores. gonna talk about commercial products. 
uh, because most of them have additives. Oh. And if you put those in your garden, you'll probably, the, the, the quick lighting additives, the, the American convenience additives are not good. Now, the one kind of charcoal that's sold at Costco from Mexico is a bag that big, that big, that big, and it is pure charcoal. Um, and I have used a mortar and a pistol, uh, a big one, called a four by four in a five gallon bucket to bruck that in little pieces and put it in my, but in my garden, I put three cubic yards in cubic yard commercial bags. The guy that I got it from each time over a number of years will be speaking here this Thursday at the CRESS meeting, Colorado Renewable Energy Society, at seven o'clock up in the main sanctuary and his name is Jonah Levine, and uh, he's been in the biochar business for a long time. He is getting, he's, he, he used to be producing in Golden, um, and now he's down near Pueblo, and it's all uh, from wood chips from uh, Beetle Kill. And, uh, and I think his operation, and he's not the owner, he's the managing director, I think, but his total operation, I think, is energy outputting as well as biochar. If you take biochar and you sprinkle it all over farmers' fields, their yields go up. Biochar was originally discovered by Native Americans in Amazonia because their soils were red and leached and it was hard to really grow stuff and they would burn off in a smoldering way a lot of cuttings and pretty soon that area turned black. There it was called terra preta, black, or earth black. And, and they found that weeds grew better and then the plants grew better. And anthropologists, pale faces, went down and learned this 30, 40 years ago now. And it's slowly getting into ag schools as esoteric topics. It's not really getting full-blown uh, activation. But biochar is an interesting thing. And because we're in such an ugly point on the atmosphere, this is something that actually takes stuff out of the atmosphere and puts it in the soil whereas fossil fuel companies take it out of Mother Earth mm -hmm. and put it in the atmosphere. So that reversal, if all the farming took advantage, would help us address the problem that we face. Yeah. Well, I was reading, uh, especially on videos, uh, YouTube, about something called cover crops instead of leaving your dirt, uh, let's say your vegetable garden uh, bare or the ultraviolet, I would bake it and kill off the first few layers of uh, bacteria and fungus. You put, I don't know, uh, clover or vetch or something else that will re, well do it, two or three things. In the case of uh, legumes, it would actually nitrogen. put nitrogen in the soil, but the yeah. other thing is it put leaves deep down, and the leaves, excuse me, excuse me, the roots, the roots would provide uh, homes for the bacteria, the mold, the fungus, all that good stuff. Yeah. And the nice thing about that is it uh, preserves the soil from getting bleached and washed away by, by wind the and snow and the wind and yeah. rain and all that stuff. Yeah. And, and the fact yeah. that it's actually storing more energy below ground. It, um, that's really all next week's topics. And so, <laughs> but um, if there's nothing else, I actually made it on time. Thank you and happy Earth Day to you. Happy Earth Day to you. Happy Earth Day, happy Earth Day. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> we wish you a happy birthday. We wish you a happy birthday. Wish you a happy birthday and a livable planet. Thank you. Thank you. Good.